Alright. Well, we've been in the book of Romans. Can anybody tell me why Paul wrote the book of Romans? He was, he was what? On his way where? He wanted to go to Spain. He wanted to go to Spain, and he was going to go through Rome, and he was looking for the church there to kind of support him on his trip there, and so he was going to travel through there. He always wanted to be there and visit there, but he had not been able to do that because of his ministry on the east side of the Roman Empire. Now he's moving to the west side of the Roman Empire in his planning, and he's going to go all the way to Spain. We don't know historically if he ever got there, but in chapter 1, verses 1 through 15, Paul kind of explains all that as an introduction. And then in chapter 1, verses 16 through chapters 5, verse 21, Paul lays out his gospel message. He, and his basic gospel message is that all have sinned, that includes both the Gentile nations, which are non-Jewish nations, which did not, were not given the law of Moses, were not given the Old Testament. And those nations, they, they knew God at one point, but they drifted away from Him through idolatry, and therefore they needed the gospel. And then he talks about the Jewish nation. In chapter 2, he talks about how the Jewish nation was given the Word of God, the commandments of God, the tabernacle, all those things, and yet they drifted away from God as well because there's something in human nature that's broken. And he talks about that in chapter 5, that when Adam sinned, something changed in us to where now sin has dominion over us instead of us having dominion over it. And so Jesus Christ came to die on the cross to forgive us for the sins that we've committed against God, and also to restore dominion to our lives. So that's the gospel, that everybody needs the gospel. So he kind of paints the, the bad picture first in chapter 1 and chapter 2, and then he starts giving the good news. So it's like, you know, it's like the old jokes, I got good news and bad news, bad news what do you want first? You know, like the guy that had surgery, you know, had, had leg surgery, and he came out of surgery, and the doctor said, he said, uh, you want, he says, good news and bad news, what do you want first? The guy says, I want the good news. He said, the good news is the surgery went fantastic. He said, what's the bad news? He said, well, we operated on the wrong leg. Yeah. Yeah. So good news or bad news, Paul gives the bad news first. We've all sinned. Nations drift. People drift from God. It leads to all kinds of bad things, both Jewish and Gentiles. So Christ came to justify us, clear us of our guilt, and that we all need the gospel. And then in chapter uh, 6, actually it's a misprint in number 3, it should be chapter, after I, I, I don't know what I did there, I, it should be chapter 6 through chapter 8. Paul is answering the question, how should we live in light of the grace of God? Because the rumor that was spreading around about the Apostle Paul, all through the Roman Empire, wherever he went to preach, was that Paul was preaching a message of basically of what we would call greasy grace. Where God forgives you for your sins and you can do whatever you want. And grace means that you just don't have any requirements to live a certain way. And Paul is going to emphatically say there that that's just not the case. That in fact, grace doesn't just forgive us from sins. It gives us power over sin that we can begin to live a victorious life. Now Paul is realistic. He talks about how even though that we have dominion over sin, we still struggle with it. It's like Matt was preaching on Sunday. He talked about being dead to sin. We are dead to sin, but if you remember a few weeks or months ago, I said sin is not dead to us. Is that we, in Christ, we die to sin, but sin still is not dead to us. It tries to tempt us and allure us and tries to... And so Paul talks about in chapter 7 of Romans, his own personal fight with the allure of sin and how he struggled with, even though he wanted to do right, he often found himself doing wrong. And I think we all can relate to the Apostle Paul. And then he goes in the chapter and he says, but how do I get free from this? I begin to live my life. I orient my life towards a lifestyle of pleasing God to the power of the Holy Spirit instead of orienting my life to pleasing myself. And that's the difference between the follow of Christ. Is that grace gives us, the, we, we, we follow Christ and we get distracted and sometimes we sin, sometimes we fall. But we get that orientation back again. We get, we get forgiven and we get back on track. He is not preaching and he's not teaching Perfection. No one is perfect. And so we have to orient our lives. He's talking about a lifestyle. Now in chapter 9, chapter 9 through chapter 11, Paul was dealing with a very fundamental question that the people in this time period would have wanted answered. And that is, what about Israel? Because this is around 56 AD. What's happening in 56 AD is the church is becoming largely Gentile, mostly non-Jewish. But it started with a Jewish Messiah. Are they okay in there? Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> youth. Yeah. Youth. Oh, it was youth? I thought it was the Bible, the, the Bible class. I'm like, yeah. dude, they're having more fun than us. We play with Jordan. <laughs> but if it's the youth, ah, well, we'll just we'll let them have their fun. Mm. But what's happening in 55, 56 is that there's, there's a shift. And, and, and so there really is a jealousy thing going on. Uh, the Jewish nation, by and large, Jew Judaism was kind of jealous of the Christian movement. They persecuted it. They were the number one persecutors. In about 10 years or, so, or less, Christianity and Judaism would totally split. And so they would be two separate religions. Uh, and they've been separate since 70 AD when Jerusalem just was destroyed and, and the Romans invaded uh, the land of Israel. And so this is a very hot topic. And this, this gets into what we call eschatology, the study of end times. And when you pay attention in the book of Romans to Paul, every time he mentions Jewish things, you kind of get, if you, if you read in each section, because he addresses them in each section, you kind of get an idea of what we would call his eschatology, his view of end times. And as I've studied the, 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 the New Testament documents, of which there are 27, that you, you begin to realize that the apostles didn't have it all clear either. And so you can kind of get a perspective from Paul, you get a perspective from Peter, and they call them mingled together, but it really is kind of obscure. We really don't know as much as we think we know uh, about the end times. We just know that Jesus is going to return, he's going to get things right. But also Paul will include the nation of Israel is going to come back to the Messiah, Jesus Christ. And we'll get to that in chapter 11. And so last week we started in chapter 9. Let me just kind of review where we were in chapter 9. Um, starting in chapter 9, verses 1 through 5, was Paul's concern. He shares how concerned he is with the, for the nation of Israel because he, he is a Jewish person. He loves his country. He, he loves them so much he'd be willing to die. As we talked about, he was willing to be accursed. And that meant to be dedicated to destruction. He's willing to dedicate his life to destruction if, it would, if they would be saved. He is not talking about going to hell. He's not talking about going to hell for him. He's talking about, I would be willing to, sp say, to, to spend my life if it meant that Israel would come to God. That's in verses 1 through 5. In verses 6 through 9, Paul does a contrast because and, and he, he's answering the question, what about Israel? First of all, he says, I'm concerned about Israel. Second of all, he says, now let me give you a contrast. That, there, that the promises of God were not made to natural Israel, but to spiritual Israel, to the sons of the promise. And he, and he talks about I, Isaac being the son of promise, and then there, he's contrasting, even though he doesn't mention his name, he's contrasting Ishmael, Ishmael, who was the son of the flesh, and he's showing that in the Old Testament there's this, there is this dichotomy, there's this division between the natural and the spiritual, and you see this, and now as we come into the New Testament, Christ is the fulfillment of all the spiritual promises that were given in the Old Testament, specifically to Abraham in this context. But there's a spiritual Israel and there's a natural Israel. And the natural Israel was persecuting the spiritual Israel. If you go to the book of Galatians, you see that. Paul talks about that very clearly, I think in chapter 4. Um, and so he's letting the people know that God has not reneged on his promises because there is a remnant of people in Israel that have chosen to become followers of Christ. But for the rest, they are rejecting God. It's not so much that God is rejecting them. So he's contrasts those. Then in the third section, which is verses chapter 9, verses 14 through 24, Paul gives pretty much what I call his conclusion of the matter. And he's going to get into the subject of election, divine election, which is a hot topic among theologians and religious groups. People have argued it for 2,000 years, and nobody got it right until I got it right last week. So it's like, <laughs> finally figured it out, I got it right, right? Yeah. Uh, I gave you my take on it. I, I, don't, I don't really like to argue about these things. But one thing I do want to, want to, did want to point out last week and emphasize this week is that the word mercy is the center of the whole theme here. Everything is driven by mercy. And the point he's making in verses 14 through 24 is that election, divine election, shows God's mercy because Jacob was chosen and others were chosen before they've done good or bad. So it's not based on how our human efforts and our good works. Which isn't that a good thing? Isn't that a good thing that God didn't choose you because you're going to be the best on the team? You remember we were teasing today uh, out at lunch and we were talking about picking up teams. And we were teasing, we were picking on, actually we were picking on John McTernan and uh, saying, well, John's going to get chosen last. He's going to be that kid that nobody wants. We're just picking on him. But that's what we do. 
Okay, that's just what we do. And John can take it. He's got thick skin and broad shoulders. But isn't it great that God doesn't say, well, you have to have Bob, or you have to whatever your name is. Well, you, I guess I'll take so-and-so. Remember those days when, when you were the little runt kid, and they'd always say, you're the last one left, and they got stuck with you? That's not how God looks at it. God chooses us whether we have skills or not skills. He chooses us by His divine mercy. And election shows not the hard wrath of God, it shows the mercy of God. And we cover that in depth. So if you weren't here, it's online. You can go and listen to that if you go to our website. His wrath is shown when He offers mercy to people and they don't receive it. Because what we saw also last week is that mercy extended to the elect, those that God has foreseen would receive it, means they'll change, they'll receive it, they'll embrace it. But on vessels of wrath, and we talked about the different vessels, the potter's vessels, a vessel of wrath was a, a vessel that did not receive uh, the blood clay mixture to fix the pottery that was damaged. It would be eventually thrown away. When, wrath, when, when grace and mercy are applied to those vessels, that just makes them more obstinate. And we've seen it, have we not? I mean, you've seen people that, you know, in our culture have been given grace and grace and grace and grace and grace instead of changing it that drives them to further sin, further rebel against God. And that's the context. He's not saying in this text that God picks and chooses winners and losers from, from eternity. In fact, what he's really saying in this text is that God gives everybody mercy. And he's so merciful that even though he knows a lot of people won't receive it, he gives it to them anyway. Right. What yes. do you mean by won't receive it? The people there, themselves won't receive yeah, it? Yeah, there's people that the more mercy you give them, the worse they become. Okay. Uh, it, you know, you are a policeman, you know. You know in, in, in being a policeman that those people that if you were on the street and gave mercy to, they'd take your gun away from you and shoot you with it. Or take your club away from you and beat you with it. Because mercy looks like weakness to them. And so... And many times, I know in my own ministry career, is we have helped a lot of people. And some people have taken the help, and their lives have been changed. Other people have taken it, and they've moved on to the next sucker. Mm -hmm. Mercy extended doesn't change them, but we still were merciful anyway. Mother Teresa spent her life in Calcutta serving people and just be, doing good to people, right? Many of those people never responded to the gospel. Well, she gave mercy to them anyway. That's the kind of mercy God has. Is Even though not everybody's going to receive it, He grants it anyway. But the vessels of honor, which we were talking about last week, they not only receive the mercy, but it, it works a change in their lives. And because God is so merciful, He's willing to give everybody mercy. And not only that, we are vessels of mercy ourselves. Uh, and that's where we're going to pick up in in this text. Remember there are, four, there are four vessels talked about in verses 18 through 23. There was the vessel of honor, which was a potter's vessel that was used in everybody's house. It was placed by the front door. There would be three containers there. There would be three vessels. Two vessels of a vessel of honor, a vessel of dishonor, and a drinking vessel. Because they didn't have running water like we do. And they'd be on a stand that would have these three holes in it that they'd set in. The vessel of honor was the vessel that every vessel was intended to be. And it would have cool, clean drinking water or, hand, or water to pour on your hands and feet so after coming off a dusty road you could clean up and be prepared to, to enter the house. That water was dumped into a vessel of dishonor. So he says in verse 21, he says, Does not the potter have power of the clay from the same lump to make one vessel for honor and another for dishonor? These are two literal vessels that they used in Israel. The vessel of dishonor was a vessel of honor. The intention was for it to be a vessel of honor. But when the, when the potter worked the clay and when he put it in the kiln, a pockmark, an imperfection, a resistance to the work of the potter would show up. And so inst instead of being a vessel of honor, it ended up got, being used to take trash, dirty water. But the intention was never for it to be a vessel of dishonor. Then he's, the, the third one is a vessel of, of, of mercy. A vessel of mercy is just a vessel of honor. Same vessel that was placed out in the public square so that everybody could get, get a drink of water. Now we want to hold on to that one for tonight because we're going to pick up. Then there was a vessel of wrath. A vessel of wrath was a vessel of honor that got broken, usually at the lip. And in order to restore it, the potter would mix a certain amount of, of clay 
with a, the blood of a tick, certain tick, and that would form like a glue. They'd put it in the crack. They'd, he'd, he'd file it down. He'd perfect it, stick it back in the kiln. Most of the times, that would fix the vessel. But every so often, that, that repair job wouldn't work. They'd put it in the kiln, and it'd crack again, and he'd do it again and again and again until eventually, after so many tries of trying to apply the blood, and that's the metaphor here, the blood and redemption and fix it, after a while, he would give up and just throw the vessel away. That was called a vessel of wrath. In this text, he's saying, God, let's pick it up here, in verse 22. What if God wanted to show his wrath? So we talked about God showing here. He's showing his grace, grace and his power. His power is, ex is expressed and shown in his wrath. And to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath prepared for destruction. In other words, God's showing... He, he's being patient. He's endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath. He put up with them. And he offers them mercy. Watch what it says. And that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy which he had prepared beforehand for glory, even us. You and I, he's talking to Christians. He's saying Christians are vessels of mercy. Now, if you read this context, he's saying God has been... God has endured with much long suffering vessels of wrath. People who will refuse to heed the mercy and truth of God. Okay? He, he puts up with them. Have you ever wondered why certain things continue to happen? <coughs> Have you watched the news lately and you look at well, some of the knuckleheaded stuff that's going on in our own government, the corruption? Every night it's something new. Corruption, corruption, corruption. And you wonder why God doesn't just step in. If I were God and you were God, I would do things different. I wouldn't be putting up with this stuff, would you? But God is long-suffering. Why? Because He wants them to receive mercy. <coughs> but guess who the vessels of mercy are? You and I. What was the vessel of mercy? It was a vessel of honor put out in the public square so somebody could get a drink of water when they're thirsty. You and I are God's mercy dispensers. That's who we are. To give mercy and grace to some people that who will receive the gospel and to people that won't. And we can't, you never know who's going to receive it, right? So you don't start trying to judge it because you never know when somebody's finally going to respond to the mercy of God. So we do good. We've talked about that. Bill has his t-shirt on. We do a do good campaign every year. We do good to people. What? We're trying to give them mercy. Okay? Even us, whom he called, not of the Jews only, but also the Gentiles. Okay, we caught up. Any questions on the things I just said? Because it, as we go forth, I don't want to leave us. Any questions on the vessels or comments you want to make before I move into the rest of this text? I was just catching us up. We good? I don't know how to take the looks on your face. Either my guitar playing just threw you guys for a loop <laughs> and you're kind of trying to overcome that experience. Yeah. Or you're tired or your your attention's so focused you can't wait to go. Which one is it? C? C. C, okay. All right. Here's what he does. Paul presents his case. Paul, remember Paul's Jewish? When he talks to Jewish people in Romans, he talks kind of like a rabbi. Rabbis, you know how they taught? They taught by questions. Have you been catching how many questions are in Romans? Imaginary. He's almost like he's... He's debating. He's acting like a rabbi. He's anticipating the questions. I mean, in the next chapter, they're all over the place. Questions, questions, questions. I didn't, I've never counted them, but there's a lot of questions in Romans. That's your homework assignment. <laughs> Read through Romans and give me the number of questions are asked in Romans. Probably about 100. That's what rabbi did. They taught. They would, they would come to John and say, well, what do you think the text says? And then John would answer back with a question. And the whole goal of rabbinical teaching was to keep the argument, to keep the debate going. When Jesus was in the temple as a 12-year-old in the book of Luke chapter 2, and they said they were astounded at his answers, and, and this discussion, what Jesus was doing, what they were astounded with, is Jesus, because this is what they would do when they went through school. He was going to a test, and he was being graded. It was said they would have to keep the discussion going. And the smartest rabbi, when they're being trained younger, they could keep the discussion going and going and going and going, answering questions, asking questions. And Paul is doing that because he's talking about the Jews here. 
And now what he's going to do is he's going to do what every good rabbi would do, is quote scripture to verify his argument. Because everything had to be based on the word of God for a Jewish thinker. So what does he do? He gives what we would call today proof texts. Isn't that what we do when we preach? You know, we, we open the Bible, we read a text, and then we expound on it. This is what Paul's doing. And he starts with Hosea chapter 2, verse 23. He said, which says, and he says, I, he also says in Hosea, I will call them my people who are not my people, and her beloved who is not my beloved. Does anyone know the story of Hosea? Does anybody know what was happening in the book of Hosea? Anybody who knows want to tell me what it was? Everybody's quiet tonight. <laughs> he, was, he was named and married to Gomer. Yeah, okay. Who eventually served with Andy Griffith on the Andy Griffith show. <laughs> she was a prostitute. And she and he was and, and Hosea was told to marry this prostitute, and it was a, she was symbolic of Israel, who was unfaithful to God. And he would call her back. And, I mean, I'm glad I'm not a prophet. You know, he, he, they would call her back. And he had to live out the very message that he was preaching. And he, would, he had bought her back from slavery. So when he quotes this verse in 25, in the original Hosea, it's speaking about Israel. I will call her my people who are not my people. He's, called, he's talking about bringing Israel back. Now Paul is going a step further and applying it to the Gentiles, which is a very rabbinic thing to do. Now, I don't have time to get into how the rabbi used Scripture, but they used some Scripture very loosely. They applied Scripture. They had one, interpret you have one interpretation, but they would apply it to many different things. And that's what they call hermeneutics, but I don't want to get distracted with that tonight because it would be about an hour. And so he's talking about, here he's talking about the Gentiles. They were not God's people, but now they're being grafted into God's people. And he goes on to quote, Another verse, it says, "I shall come to pass, this is Hosea 1.10, in the place where it was said to them, you are not my people, they shall be called the sons of the living God. So he's building a biblical argument that every Jewish rabbi would have understood that the scripture is telling us in the Old Testament that God's precedent, the way God operates, is he's always looking to reach out to people that aren't his and bring them into his family. And so exclusiveness was never part of God's call for Israel. And it's not for the church. Jesus Christ is the most inclusive being in the universe. However, He does it on His terms. He doesn't, he doesn't just allow everything. There's conditions. You can't do what you want. You have, to come to, you have to come to God through Jesus Christ. That's a condition. You have to repent. Believe on Him. But He's open to everybody. Okay? We good? Everybody stand up. Everybody stand up. I need to, I, I just can feel the, the midweek fatigue. Just stretch. Everybody stretch. Yeah. <laughs> That's why I'm getting you up. Alright, stretch. Stretch. Ready? So everybody say praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. 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 I know it's hard. It's easier for me to talk and stay awake than it is for me to listen. He's just building his argument here. We can go through this pretty fast, okay? <coughs> then he quotes Isaiah. He says, Isaiah also cries out concerning Israel. Though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, the remnant will be saved. Now he's going into the remnant. He's basically saying this. Israel has rejected God, but there is a remnant. There is a small group of people in Israel that have received the gospel, and because God is so merciful, He has endured with long-suffering those that would not, so He could have mercy upon those who would receive Him. Dude, that's pretty good news. God is a gracious, merciful God. See, that's found in Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 10. Then he quotes Isaiah chapter 1, verse 9, and verse 28. He says, He will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness, because the Lord will make, a sh make short a work upon the earth. That's actually a different verse. Um, yeah. That's a different verse. I'm trying to find a reference. I didn't see that one when I was reading this. The next verse in 29 is, I don't know where that's from in the Old Testament. I have to look that up. I skipped that when I was studying. Verse 29, and Isaiah said, this is, this is Isaiah 1.9, Unless the Lord of the Sabbath 
had left us a seed, we would have become like Sodom and would have been like made like Gomorrah. Now, what does that mean? What was Sodom? What happened to Sodom and Gomorrah? Partly destroyed? No. Totally destroyed. So what Isaiah is saying is what? If God hadn't had mercy on us, we would have been totally destroyed. Talking about Israel. But God's mercy, even though they didn't deserve it, He saved the remnant. Because a remnant would receive Him. That's what He's saying. That's His argument. Then he says, what shall we say then? <coughs> that the Gentiles, non-Jews, who did not pursue righteousness, have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness of faith. But Israel, pursuing the law of righteousness, has not attained to the law of righteousness. Why? Because they did not seek it by faith, but as it were, by the works of the law. For they stumbled at the stumbling stone which is Christ, as it is written, behold, and it quotes Isaiah again, behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and a rock of offense, and whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. Paul now goes from his case that we are vessels of mercy, that we who have received Christ, both Jew and Gentile, to God has been gracious to a remnant and merciful to a remnant, a small group of people of Israel, now goes into the cause of, of Israel's rejection. In other words, God has not rejected Israel, but Israel has rejected God. Israel has rejected the good news. Israel has rejected the gospel. That God really doesn't reject anyone. Now, God will reject them if you reject Him, but God doesn't want to reject people. God's all about bringing people to Him. He's all about mercy. He's all about reclaiming people. But... They refused. And the reason they refused, he said they, he says, first of all, the Gentiles obtained righteousness. Now, what does he mean by that? Righteousness is right standing with God, having a right relationship with God. He said the Gentiles, the non-Jews who didn't have the Old Testament, they didn't have all the stuff that Israel had from God, they actually got in right relationship with God when the Jews who had all this stuff as a nation did not. And the answer is why? Because when they were given all that stuff, the Ten Commandments, <coughs> right when Charles Heston went up and got the Ten Commandments, you know, and then he came down. I remember watching the Ten Commandments when I was young. And I remember saying, why did his hair get white? <laughs> you know, why did he age? He aged. And I'm like scared of God. Like, I'm not going up to see God because I'm going to come down an old man. But yeah, it's like his glory. But he comes down with the Ten Commandments and then they got the Ten Commandments and they got the tabernacle and they got all these, the service of God, which we talked about a little bit last week, you know, the adoption, all the perks, all the things that they needed to be a godly nation. But they actually didn't get in right relationship with God. And he tells us why. Because they did it based on their human effort. They thought all these things they got from God was about them earning and working for a right relationship with God. That through their human effort, they got the Ten Commandments. I'm going to do the Ten Commandments. I'm going to do the Ten Commandments. I'm going to, I'm going to do the law perfectly. I'm going to offer the right sacrifices. I'm going to go to the temple at the right time. I'm going to celebrate the feast. I'm going to do everything right. And even though those things were a blessing, they were never intended to communicate the message that by perfect obedience and compliance, you and I can be right with God. They stumbled. They stumbled upon the stone of stumbling, which is Christ. That all those things were pointing to the fact that someday God would send His Son who would die in our place and because of His perfect obedience, because of His love and His sacrifice and what He has done, you and I can have a relationship with God. It's like Mike and I here. Let's say Mike's God. You like being God? Only for a few seconds. <laughs> Okay. Bruce Almighty, don't let it go to your head. <laughs> Let's say I, me and he's God. I'm just a human being, and we we get in, we get we have a relationship problem because on my side I, I do things wrong against him. Instead, the God didn't give the Ten Commandments so you could say you're going to earn back your relationship. He gave those commandments to help accomplish certain things in their nation, but also to show mercy and grace. It was all about about grace and mercy. But it all pointed to someday Jesus here 
<laughs> You're Jesus now. Son. <laughs> would someday die on the cross and bring us into a relationship. He would go between us and tie us together, bring us together. So when I place my faith on Jesus, I have right relationship with God through Him. Not because I'm doing all these good works, but because of what Jesus has done. Did a good job, Jesus. Thank you. Thank you. They stumbled at it. They're like, to put it in modern terms, somebody who grew up in church, always went to church, always was a good person, went to Sunday school, paid their tithes, you know, was on the board with deacons, all this stuff, did everything. They're religious. They do good things. But they don't put their faith in Jesus because they think their good works are going to get them to heaven someday when they die. Well, it's, when God created Ten Commandments and, all, and everything else, these are all tools. Yes. And if people are supposed to be guided by what God said and use these tools to teach them, you know, to keep them in a, in a straight line. Like the Ten Commandments are, you know, don't kill, don't steal, don't this. And people are supposed to abide by them but not live within these things. Yeah, not feel like they're made, they're, they're good people because they do these things. Because they're doing these things. That God deserves to have a relationship with them. It's based on what Christ did. He said they stumbled at this. Because they, they had the law. They had all these, he said, my good, why would I need to put faith in Jesus when I can put faith in myself? I just have a question because you said that the Gentiles, um, let me try to organize what I'm trying to ask. So there was like hundreds of years between the Old Testament and the New Testament, mm -hmm. and that the Gentiles didn't really get the Old Testament. So that all, they, all the Gentiles really knew at the time was Jesus, but the Jews, since they had the Old Testament, I feel like they had hundreds of years of like, um, generations that were just going by the Old Testament, so it's probably hard to break those traditions of just trying to, to, to follow the rules. It which, was. Which made it harder to, to, to try something totally different by just going through a Savior. You know what I mean? Yes. Okay. Did everybody get that? So the Gentiles had an advantage. In some ways they did. Yeah, it seems that way because they, they were starting from scratch with Jesus, yeah. whereas the Jews had to break all these traditions of the Old, mm -hmm. the old And that's why I remember when Jesus said in one place, He said uh, that... Uh, the old wine is better. I mean, if you use that parable when he said, you know, people would ask him about it. He said, the new wine, you don't put new wine in old. You, you don't put old, was it new wine in old wineskins? Would you put new wine in new wineskins? And then he said at the feast, remember when he made the water into wine, he said people like the old wine better? You know, when you combine those two thoughts together, this, that's what you're saying, is we have a tendency, and, and you see it even today, that we like tradition. So when something new comes, People have a hard time moving forward. We have in the church world to this day. We, we have a hard time adapting to new things. Cause, cause, but there's a good side of tradition. And the, and the thing to remember is, though, when we talk about this, is we don't want to stereotype too far because there was a mixture of people in Israel. Like you had people that were called blameless. and Like, like Joseph was called just. And Zechariah and Elizabeth were called blameless. And they were looking for the redemption of Israel. So you got a group, of, you got a remnant even in the nation before Jesus came. And then there was also Gentiles who had converted to Judaism. Because one of the fallacies that's going around today is, and I've heard it from mainline preachers, it's kind of got me concerned, is they act like the Gentiles never heard the Ten Commandments. That's not true. They had synagogues, Jewish synagogues everywhere in the Roman Empire. Jews were one-tenth of the Roman Empire. And they were very influential. Even in the Roman Empire. That's why people didn't like them, because they had all special privileges in the Roman Empire. Nobody likes that. And so there were many converts to Judaism because people saw that Judaism was a better way to live than the Gentile religions. But on the mass scale, it's like today, a lot of people didn't have a clue. So God is working in the nations, but it is definitely easier when you don't have to unlearn things. Like... Like playing the guitar, here's the dangerous thing about playing the guitar. I mean, I'm self-taught, you can tell. I'm teaching myself to play the guitar. You know the problem with that is? Is when somebody who really knows how to play the guitar starts teaching me, I'm going to have things unlearned. Mm -hmm. Right? The Gentiles in some ways didn't have that. They had other problems. Okay? So that's good. But religious folks, we have to be careful this one here. Because, man, we get attached to stuff. You know, I, I remember my first church. It's easy for me to talk about my first church. When I go to my next church when I'm 80, I'll talk about this church. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I 
But I remember, you know, after a couple of weeks of being, being the pastor there, I changed the pulpit because it was a big pulpit. It was like, you remember that song, Mighty Fortress is Our God? That was that pulpit. Yeah. You know? And I, had, I, I don't like things between me. You know, I don't even use a pulpit today. I don't like things between me and a congregation. I want to make sure I'm connecting and I can see you and, and interact with you. So I, I changed it and I got this little tiny pulpit that had a real stick-like leg. I mean, it was thin, man. And I was thin back then, so I could hide behind it, but things were changing. <laughs> they hated it. Oh, I got complaints about that. Five years later, when I came to Eagle's Nest, what do you think the first thing they did was? They did. They put it back. They, took, they put the old pulpit back. Oh, after you left? Oh, yeah. the I mean, they, they, no Sunday went by. How'd you know? Did you went back and checked? People told me. We know people. Uh, yeah, we know people. <laughs> yeah, you did. Yours a grapevine. I listened to Marvin Gray. I heard it through the grapevine. Yeah. That's what was holding that church back. Yeah. It's not that God wants us to ditch tradition. Because that we, we, we're living in a time now we need more tradition. We have gone so far now in the contemporary church that we have preachers now telling us to throw this away. This is too traditional. Tradition is how you communicate value from one generation to the next. You need tradition. But what you have to make sure of, it's not tradition of itself that's the problem. You've got to make sure you understand and make sure your tradition is consistent with what this says. Because what Israel had done is they had added all these things, traditions, that contradicted the Word of God. And they were more in love with that tradition that would make them feel superior. It's kind of like legalism today. Legalism, legalism is when we think we can follow these certain set of rules. And, 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 and I've met a lot of legalistic people that are good people. But what I've learned is one of the reasons why people like legalism is it gives them this sense of security that they're okay with God. Well, that's not in a bad thing of itself, but it's a false security because our security is in ski here. Ski. Jesus. Uh-oh. <laughs> That's what they were stumbling at. You know, it, it, it's, and it's what you're saying. And it's like the longer we serve God, you know, I have, to, I have to grab a hold of myself several times for every year. I grab a hold of myself and say, Bob, God's not on your side because you're a preacher and have given your life to the gospel. You're no different than anybody else. You, you, you're not God. You don't replace God. You need Him just as much as everybody else. Don't get confident in your doctorate degree, in your training, in whatever successes I've had. The fact that I'm like the best guitar player in the world, I don't want to get confident in that. <laughs> My album's coming out next week. <laughs> with, the with, the, with the book, yeah. yeah. You can get the calendar everything else. It's going to be all good <laughs> We, we tend to start trusting other things, and that's what he's talking about. And we want to bring that into our world. I mean, rea reality is, you know, like I, I've been through some things in the last years and even in the last few weeks, and I'm really dealing with, Bob, what do you trust in? Because I struggle like you do, just like they do. So we don't want to condemn them, but we want to take the heed, the warning. Our trust is in Christ. Well, if you ask somebody what makes a good husband or what makes a good wife, you can say, well, I bring her flowers. I do, you know, you can yes. all these things. But where's the relationship? You know, you can ditch everything else if you don't have a relationship. That's good now. That's good now. It's really good. good you complete know. preacher's class. Mm. <laughs> That's good. It's, and Christ, in the whole context is mercy. They're rejecting mercy. They're choosing, as at this time, they're choosing their own good works, religious works, versus a free gift. It'd be like somebody wanting to give you a million dollars. I'll give it to you, and you refuse. I got to work for it. No, I got to earn it. Do you think they understood it and rejected it, or do you think they didn't understand it? And that's the reason why they rejected it. I think they did not understand it, but I think the problem was they didn't want to understand it. It's like the parable of the sower. It says the first seed. It says it fell on some fell by the wayside, which was hard. And the soil didn't receive it, and the birds came and ate it up. And Jesus explains that that's the devil taking the seed. That their hearts were hard, so they couldn't receive the understanding. 
And I exegeted that text. I need to preach that text to you from the Greek sometime. The English obscure, obscure some things in that text. It's not that they couldn't understand it when it says that, 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 that they didn't understand it in that text, which is what the English says. It's that, that, that word understanding in the Greek is they didn't receive it. They hardened their hearts. Back to the hardening of hearts again. We're back to the hardening of hearts. But God gives the grace, gives the mercy, but they wouldn't receive it. We want to open ourselves up and say, God, I need mercy. It's what I was, pre what I was preaching about a couple weeks ago when I said when you're struggling, you turn your heart to God and say, God, I turn towards you. That's repentance. And I receive grace that you would soften my heart and soften the soil and give me the ability because I don't have the ability to save myself. But we sometimes, even after we receive Christ, we want to clean ourselves up and fix ourselves and make ourselves good because we feel like that's what we owe God. When what God's really looking for us to do is to code, Father, Daddy, I can't do this. Would you help me? He's not going to do it all for us. He's going to do it with us. It's a relationship. So like keeping the Ten Commandments, He wants you to keep the Ten Commandments. But he, he will help you. He writes the law in our hearts and He begins to work on the inside so we want to do what's right. Does that make sense? They were struggling with, they were taking the external things and they were trying to earn their righteousness or their right standing with God. So it'd be like, it's like kind of like another husband and wife thing. You know, the husband forgets the wife's anniversary. So what does he do for the next two weeks? He buys her flowers and candy. He's trying to earn forgiveness. That's why I'm glad I have a wife of mercy and grace. She doesn't expect flowers and candy from me. Just kidding. <laughs> Not to earn her forgiveness. She gets it because I love her. Are you hearing me? That's the thing. They're, that's what he's saying here in his, in, in his language. They stumbled upon it. Because they wanted to establish their own righteousness. He goes on to say, let's look, keep on the verse. Verse 10, chapter 10, verse 1. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. He's back to his desire. He's back to this passion that he has uh, for his people. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God. They have a passion for God. But not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness, in other words, the way God makes us right between us, the way God establishes a relationship between us, they're ignorant of that. But they're really willfully ignorant. If you want to really get the, 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 the fine point here. They, they, they've been offered the truth, but they're rejecting it. And seeking to establish their own righteousness, their own goodness, so that they can have a relationship with God, have not submitted to the righteousness of God. It's pride. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. In other words, when he says Christ is the end of the law, he's saying everything in the Old Testament was pointing to Jesus. The sacrifices. First, you know, to enter church, you know, this is how they went to church. You would go to the tabernacle, the temple, and first you had to offer a burnt offering. But if you had sinned, you had to start with a sin offering. So you'd have to get your sin taken care of first. Then after you got your sin taken care of, which was a picture of Christ, you had to lay your hands on this animal, confess your sins over it, and they went and killed it. And that was a picture of Christ. Even on the Day of Atonement, they had, they had one scapegoat that they'd put a, their hands on the goat's head, confess the sins of the people, they'd kill that goat, they'd take another one, lay their hands on it, confess their sins, and send that into the wilderness, which is a type of forgiveness. And release. That's in Leviticus 16. That pointed to what Christ was going to do. They had to, then they had to go into a burnt offering. After you had a sin offering, sin's taken you had a burnt offering. Burnt offering was totally consumed, which meant you had to be totally devoted to God. And then they had a peace offering, which was, a, was like a fellowship offering. It's a, that was the only part of the offering they got to eat. It was their fellowship with God. They had to go through these rituals all over the place and all these things, and it was very difficult. But all these things pointed that to Christ who is the end. He is the burnt offering. He is the sin offering. He is the fellowship offering. He is all that stuff. All these things they taught in the Bible. Think about this. For 1,500 years... The way they lived, the way they ate, the way they dressed, the way they did everything pointed to Jesus. And when Jesus showed up, guess what? 
And he stand, God standing right there. Matt preached it this week. He had no form nor comeliness. Isaiah 53. That we would desire Him. Because they were expecting this Messiah, this triumphant King to come and destroy the Romans. They had all these expectations of God that He never promised to deliver on. Hear me, church. This has bothered me my whole ministry career. I've watched as... what well, You guys are probably not familiar with this as much as I am, but what I call expectation theology... Expect God to do great things. That was popular for a while in the 90s. Still popular somewhat today. Just throw out expectations. You know, a lot of people got disappointed. God doesn't do everything we want Him to do. He will always do what He promises. But He's always late. I've had a number of promises from God. They never happened when I think they happen. In fact, I have a pattern. A pattern in my life is just when a promise is about to get fulfilled, I run out of gas before it gets there. I don't know about you, but I get to the place, I can't do this anymore, it's not going to happen, I'm, Lord, when are you going to show up? He shows up the next day and I feel like a eel. Anybody relate to that? And every time you think by now, I, I, get, I get the cycle. It's about to happen because I feel like quitting. That means it's about to happen. Is that not what happens in the Bible all the time? He goes to Abraham says, you're going you're gonna to be a father of a great multitude. Well, God, I can't have any kids. I went to the fertility clinic and they said I can't have any kids. 25 years later, I can't have any kids. I got this Ishmael guy, he's a pain in the neck. God waits until we're out of gas. The whole point he's trying to make in the Old Testament to the Jews is... It's not about you. It's not up to you. It's not about your effort. It's that I love you and I'm merciful and I want a relationship with you. And I'll throw out everything you've ought to done. I'll forgive everything. All I need you to do is point yourself towards me and say, yes. And then I'll even change you. I'll change your heart from the inside out. I'll, the thing that is sinful and is disgusting and, and wearing your life out and ruining it, I will begin to change the desires of your heart. So you won't even want to do that thing. But what do we do? i got to change for God. i got to be this person. And folks, I'm guilty of that just as you are. But the whole... I guess because I'm getting older, I'm, beginning to, I'm actually beginning to understand the gospel. You're the hero, I'm the zero. And you love me. And you're going to make me good enough to have a relationship with you. Because I can't do it. And neither can you. Christ is the end. He's the goal. Everything is pointing to Him. Everything is fulfilled in Christ. For everyone who believes. Jew or Gentile. Do you notice Everyone. Are you and everyone? You and everyone. For Moses writes about the righteousness which is of the law, the Old Testament. The man who live, the man who does these things, shall live by them. Now let me catch up in your notes. Number six, Paul is quote contrasting here. Romans 10, 5-13, the righteousness of the law, right standing with God through the Ten Commandments in the Old Testament, with righteousness or right standing with God through the law versus the righteousness of God through faith. He says in verse 5, the righteousness of the law requires heroic efforts to achieve. This is this point he's making. If you're going to follow the Old Testament and follow all those rules to earn your way to heaven and earn your way to a relationship, you're going to have to have a Herculean effort You've got to be perfect. But the righteousness which is of faith is easy. Watch what he says. He says the man's got to live by them. He's quoting the Old Testament found in Leviticus 18.5. But the righteousness of faith speaks in this way. He's talking about the righteousness that comes through the gospel. Do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven. In other words, if, if, if you're going to be right with God, you've got to go all the way to heaven to get the answer. He's saying it's not, it's not Heraclean. You don't have to go up to heaven to get it. 
He says that is to bring Christ down from above. Now, I have to be honest. I looked at several commentators on these two verses. These are some of the hardest verses that I know of. And there were pages and pages of notes. And I still don't quite understand what he's saying here. Totally. Okay? So I'm going to give you the summary, the nutshell, what everybody seems to agree with, but there's a lot of disagreement on what he means by to bring Christ down. Basically, what I think he's saying here, and I, like I said, I've not found an answer to this that I'm completely satisfied with, but he's saying that you can't bring Christ down. It's impossible. He's saying the, right, the righteousness of faith is not an impossible thing that you have to try to reach into heaven and bring Christ down. He's saying, or who will descend into the abyss? In other words, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. That's to try to resurrect. These are two impossible things. He's saying the righteousness of faith, getting right relationship with Him and right standing with God is not an impossibility if you do it God's way. But if you do it according to your self-effort and try to earn it through by being a good person, by keeping all these commandments and rituals, and he's not saying be a bad person. He's saying you're just never going to get there. He's saying then it's an impossibility. He's contrasting these two. He goes, it's verse 8. But what does it say? What does the righteousness of God say? What does God say about it? The word is near you. In your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. He says... He says, it's near, it's so near to you that it's gotta be, all it's got to be is in your heart. Now, how close is that? How easy is that? And all you got to do is confess it. All you got to do is, when he says confess, he's not just talking about saying it. He's talking about putting trust in it. Verse 9. He uses two of the most famous verses in the Bible. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. Now let's talk about saved. We immediately think it means getting to heaven, doesn't it? It does mean that, but it's more than that. Paul has been talking about sin. He's been talking about dominion. He's been talking about us not being able to change our lives, of, of trying to do good but ending up failing. He's saying the secret sauce to getting victory in our lives, not just getting to heaven and not just having a right relationship with God, but overcoming sin and being saved is to trust in Jesus. Jesus, I can't be good enough. Lord Jesus, I can't do this. Lord Jesus, I can't ever be good enough to whatever it is you're trying to do in my life. And I look to you. You're good enough. You're the hero. I put my trust in you. Then all of a sudden, he's saying you get set free. It's just kind of counterintuitive. But the Jews were saying, you have to do it. You have to do it. You have to do it. And he's saying you can't do it. It's too far away. It's like trying to go to heaven. It's like trying to go to hell. You can't do it. That's the best understanding of those verses that I can come up with right now. And he says, For with the heart, I preached on this recently, the heart one believes unto right standing with God and with confession, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, now he's quoting Isaiah again, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon Him. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. He's saying, he's explaining why, what about Israel? He's saying they're rejecting God because God made it too easy. Have you ever heard the statement, some things are too good to believe that are true? It's too good to be true. You can get to heaven based on what Jesus did, not what you did. Now, you can get free from sin. You can change your life. You can even lose weight. You can change your diet with God's help. I, that's how I live, folks. Everything that's important to me, I go to God, I say, God, I can't do this, or I can't do it as good as you can do it. Help me. Help me. Because He can save me with areas I can't save myself. Now, he's not, I'm not saying I'm lazy. Daddy says that. But <laughs> Are you hearing me? You put your heart toward God. You believe in Him. You know, you hear all the time, you need to believe in yourself. No, you need to believe in Him. And He'll give you the right orientation about yourself. I'm going to preach some messages on this pretty soon. So just hang in there. You know, there's a lot of self-esteem issues in our country. 
But good self-esteem comes from Him, believing in Him, knowing Him. It'll change your self-esteem issues. He loves you. Nobody's better than you. So when somebody talks down to you, who do you think you are? You know better than me. You're a sinner just like I am. You need Jesus. What's everybody equality comes from that. All right. Questions on that. I see what time it is. Questions, comments. We're still awake. We good? When we say Israel rejected the gospel, are, are we saying the the people as a whole, the religious leaders? Uh, yes. All of that. He's saying basically as a general thing. It's like a stereotype. He's saying generally they rejected. The majority of the Israelites in Israel did not receive the gospel. But we know from the book of Acts, many did. And we know from the book of Acts that the gospel went throughout all the land. Okay, But by this time, the church is predominantly becoming Gentile, and there's a lot of Jews that have rejected the gospel. I mean, the book of Hebrews is written around 60 to 65 A.D., and you got people turning back from Christ to Judaism. And the first generation hasn't gone by yet. We think that we got problems here, like, oh, I'd like to go back to the days of the apostles. No, you wouldn't. The average person lived to 22. Rome was brutal. You know, we read about these old people in the Bible. They were rare. We have a lot of misconceptions about that time period because we read little excerpts of the in the Bible and we get a picture, like even them being very religious. A lot of, a lot of Jews back in Jesus' day were wicked. Jesus called it a wicked and perverse generation. But there were good people who were try, like you and I, trying to live for God, trying to make sense of the world, waiting for redemption, waiting for God to move on their behalf, struggling with everyday things, just like we do. And they received Him. I don't know how many it was. I mean, I've heard different numbers. I don't know how we know. Just like I know by the, the one writer said that by the time of 70 A.D., there was 250,000 Christians in Ephesus in that area. I don't know how they know that. You know, they may be right, they may be wrong. I just know that the church was alive. What's that? 23 and me told them. 23 and me told them. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, is that is that a lot? I mean, I, I don't know what the population It's a lot for back then when you figure they started with a they were following a convicted criminal who was crucified by his own people. Think about where Christianity started from. Jesus was rejected by his own people. And then within, you know, within 40 years, a whole generation, they totally turned the world upside down. And then within 300 years, they're running the whole European government. Well, maybe that's a little bit, by 500 years. But I mean... You look at the advancement of Christianity throughout the world, it is pretty amazing when you look at the humble beginning. You know, Jesus, if anybody was picked that he's going to not make it and not, and not fulfill his prophecies, it would be Jesus. But he said, it's like leaven, it's going to, going to expand. This gospel is going to go to the whole world. I mean, and it has, and everything's been against it. That's why, you know, like today, folks, there's a movement. I hope that you're not hearing these things because I'm hoping that you're sheltering your ears from these things, but... I have to keep an eye out for this. There is a movement against the Word of God right now. And this is, all, this is not new. But every movement in history that's ever gone up against this book has failed. Voltaire was an atheist who wanted to destroy the Word of God. They printed Bibles, or at least for a while, they printed Bibles out of his house 50 years after he died. He's turning over in his grave. Amen. This book is sealed in blood. The people that wrote this, Isaiah got sawed in half. Jeremiah was persecuted, thrown in a cistern. You go down over and over. This book is sealed in blood. Don't take it lightly. The, the, fact that you, the fact that you have an English book, a Bible, people die trying to give you this book. And people are acting like they just want to throw it away. I'm like, dude, there, there's very few things in my life I'm willing to shed my blood over. You can take this to the bank. Um, how'd I get on that? But 
there's a lot of stuff going on right now. I'm trying to get us back to the book. I'm trying to get us even with commentary. It's like they say today that the internet is the new commentary, like listening to preaching and teaching. And I'm really just trying to get your head back in the book. Read the book. Read the book. Read the book. Get to understand what he's saying in the Word of God. It will never do you wrong. And if it does you wrong, you probably don't understand it. Could it be that we're messed up and not God? Could there be just a little chance? You know, and it went back to the same thing, arrogance. They, they had a pride, and we have a pride today because of our learning and because of our education. We think we know things that we don't know. And he says it's about the heart. He goes back in verse 10. The heart one believes. Then he, then he goes into the next section. He talks about um, how that people are going to get faith. This is verses 9, this is verses 14 through 17. Uh, he's basically answering, he answers the question. He says, How then shall they call upon him in whom they've not believed? And how will they believe in him on whom they've not heard? And how will they hear without a preacher? He's saying, The gospel's got to be preached and to hear the message. Now, watch what he says. This is very simple here. And how. Uh, how beautiful, he quotes Isaiah again, are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. He's talking about the gospel. But have they not all but but they have not all obeyed the gospel? For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? This is Isaiah 53, 1. So then faith comes by hearing and the hearing by the word of God. So here's what he's saying. He says, in order to get faith, you have to have the gospel preached to you. And then when the gospel is preached, you believe. And he connects believing with obeying it, which means obeying means put your faith in Jesus, not yourself. And then he says, but in verse 18, but have they not heard? He says, yes, they have. They've heard the gospel. Yes, indeed. Their sound has gone out to all the earth. He quotes Psalm 19.4 here. And their words to the end of the world. Talking about the preachers of the gospel. You don't want to get me started on that one. I can make a strong case that the gospel has already been preached to the entire world in the first century. Strong case. You'll have to beg me sometime to teach on that. I get riled up on that one. But I say, did Israel not know? First Moses says, I will provoke you to jealousy by those who are not a nation. I will move you to anger by a foolish nation. He's saying God prophesied in the Old Testament that someday he would provoke his children to jealousy. Why is he provoking Israel to jealousy? So they will come back to him. Not out of anger. He's hoping that, you know, you ever have you ever be jealous? Now, I know nobody here has ever been jealous or envious. <laughs> I've never been envious, never been jealous. No, 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 not me. You want what somebody else has got? Well, God's saying He's going to make them jealous over what the Christians have so they'll come back to Him. Because God loves people. And what He's trying to explain here is God's not rejected Israel. Israel has rejected Him. They had a history of it. And now in the last 40 years that the gospel is, by now it's 30 some years, they're coming up on the 40 year mark and the nation is largely rejecting him and it's going to have dire consequences. It's going to cause their nation to be destroyed. But God gave them 40 years of mercy to hear the gospel and many received him. But Isaiah is very bold and says, I was found by those who do not seek me. They'd be the Gentiles. I was made manifest to those who do not ask for me. But to Israel, he says, all day long I've stretched out my hands to the disobedient and contrary people. Finish like this. Here's a question that I want us to think about. I talked about the vessel of wrath. Here's the question that Paul is really answering. Is Israel a vessel of wrath? To be thrown away. His answer is no. no. There's a remnant. Are there some? But this is, you could say the same with the Gentiles. But he's dealing with Israel because they're, remember, they didn't have the last 2,000 years of history to, to work through theology and things. They're trying to deal with their, what's going on in the world. And, and many of them literally believed that Jesus physically was going to come in their lifetime and rapture them out and set up his kingdom. We've had 2,000 years since then where he hasn't done that. And we're trying to make sense of that still to this day. But God didn't reject them. 
they rejected God. God keeps pouring out mercy and mercy and mercy. And so if we have an area in our lives and it's not right, don't try to earn forgiveness. Just turn to Him and say, Lord, I receive mercy. Help me change. And He will. And it will begin to change your heart. That's the principle here. Now we're going to go into to more next week, but let's wrap this up. Are there any questions on that? Paul's a complicated thinker because he, he contrasts, he, he gets into deep thoughts, he, he, he uses Scripture in a certain way, and, and uh, the thing to remember is, folks, a lot of people rejected Paul's preaching. Especially the Jews. Especially the Jews. But he got it right. And now we have to apply it to our lives today. Any questions? So the answer is no, they're not a vessel of wrath. And we'll go into more next week. Anything, any questions? Or we've got a few minutes before the other class is let out. If you have any questions on anything, I'll be glad to. You guys endure to the end here. It really drives some of the fact, like in Acts, about how when Paul would go to another town, the Jewish leaders would, would come to the government and say, this guy's just stirring up trouble. This guy is trying to turn the world upside down and everything. And, and yeah, you think it's just like, just because, uh, because of Christ, but it's also, once again, all the stuff that just takes everything that they know and just turns it completely around. They hated Paul because <clears throat> Paul was high up in Judaism. And he was a threat to the whole system. That's why they killed Jesus. He was a threat to the system. And Paul, can you think about like the vice president of the United States converting to Jesus in this time period? And, and, and they're hating him because they know if they don't get rid of this guy, he could lead many more Jews to Jesus. And they didn't like that. Yes? Oh, um, I was going to say, your illustration before, I never realized it before, but your illustration with the two gifts, and how they did it, and they bring their works to the first gift, and they burn it. it. It never dawned on me. They must have watched this thing hundreds of thousands of times and never really got the picture. That first gift is your works, and the end result was they died. Mm -hmm. And the second gift was Christ, and that got set free, mm -hmm. and you got set free. That's good. Mm -hmm. Watching that and never getting it, because they were going through the ritual of what it was. Going to the ritual. It's, it's exactly, it's no different today when you preach. I mean, as a preacher, look, I don't say who and when and all that because I'm not trying to point anybody out, but people sat under my teaching, they sat under better teachers than me, heard the gospel explain and walk out and never receive it. Never get it. You know, there is a place where it's between them and God. I don't have all the answers to that, but that's what they did. We do it today. That's why we want to turn our hearts towards Him. So that he can open our understanding and our hearts so that we can get it. Because that's that's exactly right. It's really it's a travesty. Now he's going to circle back in chapter 11 and say that at the end of this thing, Israel will be saved. Because God doesn't give up on people. God, when God makes a promise, he keeps it all the way to the end no matter what we do. Sometimes we get spanked, but he still keeps his promise. Somebody else have something to wonder? That's good. That's a good illustration of dead works. Which Hebrews talks about. Repentance from dead works. Mm -hmm. That before we come to Christ, our works are dead. There's no spiritual life in them. And that's why Paul talks about needing a resurrection. He says we were dead in our sins and trespasses. By the way, you don't need self-help. You need a resurrection. We're dead. There's nothing alive. We, we lost our spiritual life. And Christ gives it back to us by what He's done. Good. It's good stuff. Mercy. Mercy, God's a merciful God. It will really be emphasized when the Jews come back, at what point, and however. Thousands of years. Yeah, like, like the thing that's got me kind of concerned right now is I believe we could be near the end of Western civilization. I don't know what follows. That's what happened when Jesus came. That was the end of the Jewish civilization. And I'm reading writers now that are starting to talk about it. I've been thinking about this for years, but I've never developed the thought. But it's like, what follows? Is it the return of Christ, or is he going to rebirth? Because an end of something is always the beginning of something else. Mm -hmm. And so I don't fear it, but I'm like, I'm trying to think. Like, I think in a hundred years, what's the world going to look like? I mean, it's hard to envision right now. And if I said what I think, I'd be 
considered a heretic, a fascist, or some kind of weird Bible thumper. I mean, you got to be careful what you say these days. But, uh, but no matter what happens, Christ, until he returns, is going to be working in the hearts and lives of people, trying to give them mercy and trying to get them to turn around. Um, so I don't fear it. I just feel on the, I want to be on the right side. Dead works, but in the right with the right motivation, faith without works is dead. Yep. So it's the motivation. They had zeal without knowledge. Here's the other thing. I had to learn this when I was younger. I was all zeal and ignorance combined. It's not a good combination. When I first got saved, man, I, I needed to be locked up. Man, I was zealous. You just have no idea. Zealous. But I was stupid. And I believe the Lord looked down from heaven and said, man, he's got a pure heart, but he is a, an idiot right now, and he needs wisdom. And I started bumping my head on a thing called life and reality. And I had to wise up. Because I had zeal. I mean, I was an epileptic, got healed, walked out of the church, and nobody told me how you're supposed to live. I just got on fire for Jesus. <laughs> Something wrong with your printing press? It's Jesus. The answer is Jesus. <laughs> you got a flat tire? The answer is Jesus. <laughs> no, the answer is you got a lug wrench and change thing. <laughs> I was a little. I, mean, I drove my family nuts, but they knew that I'd received a miracle. I was just. Oh, everybody done? Oh. I was listening to uh, my favorite radio station today, and the guy that comes on called Todd Starnes, and he, uh, he always comes up, comes on with a Christian type thing, and just think of what you said when you're early, when you said you know they're throwing us out of the churches and. Todd Starnes came out and actually said that Harvard University is refusing admittance to Christians. And then uh, there's a homosexual movement that's barring the Christians from Harvard for certain reasons. And it's really, really hit me like a rocket. And I read that it's incredible what we're going through. Yeah, I, I think, though, here's where I'd say the good news is. Sin has a way of burning itself out, of overplaying its hand. And we can't really, at this point, you really can't discern what's happening in our country from the news. Because I think God's afoot doing something. You want to create a hunger in people? Take something away from them. You know, the Soviets closed their nation for 70 years to the gospel. And when the doors opened, millions of people got saved. I read a story, uh, Chuck Colson, I think, recorded it, about a young girl in Russia that was about seven or eight years old. She came up to her mommy, her mother, one day and said, Mommy, I believe in God. Now, this is during the closed years. And the girl said, Why, honey? She said, They keep teaching me in school that God doesn't exist, so I figure there must be one. <laughs> <laughs> if they're going out, this is a seven, eight year old kid figuring out, you know, if they're going out of their way to tell me something and over and over, she figured it out. That's where, like, I don't get caught up in all the. That, that stuff is happening. But I can tell you, God is moving. And, I, and, and it's my hope for this country that. The move of God is coming amongst our younger generations. That God has not forsaken us. He's not forsaken the prayers of His people. Now, am I saying everything's going to be easy? And that No, because I, I just have read too much history and too much Bible. But we don't need to be pessimistic. We need to be optimistic. God is moving. But there are people who want to shut us down. That just tells me how scared they are of what God's doing. You know? Um... The gospel of Jesus and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. the church. It, it's funny, we were, we were in Russia in the early 90s when the, the big movement went, they legalized religion, quote unquote. And when we were there, it was just, we, we went to a, a, a service and it was like hundreds of people just being baptized. baptized. Big, big tubs that, that they were just lined up and everything. And I mean, you know, of course, at, at the same time, they also allowed, you know, when they legalized religion, we saw Moonies. Sure, you saw all kinds. Saw, yeah, yeah, yeah mm -hmm. and, uh, and Hare Krishnas and that kind of stuff. But it, it really touched us when we were watching there about how just these people just hungry, hungry for the gospel. You know, just, and we don't need to worry about all those things because 
for people that are reasonable and objective, mm -hmm. the gospel stands on its own. Mm -hmm. The truth stands on its own against any objective test. That's why what they're trying to do now is shut us down because they don't have an answer. Mm -hmm. Just like the evolution-creation debate, I can argue that on science, not just theology. Mm -hmm. you know, they don't have the answers. You know, they're making this stuff up. Mm -hmm. And so, so what do they try to do? They try to silence the opposition. The gospel is powerful. People fear it. But that's that mercy thing, that mercy wrath thing. You know, people get some people get hardened, some people receive it. Keep dispensing mercy. I just leave you one example. I know I've shared this before, but it just reminds me of what we heard when we went to Cuba about four or five years ago. We visited Cuba, John John Hainan and myself and and uh, his wife Diana, we went down to to Cuba. Remember, John? They were telling us that the Cuban government forbid evangelism. They told all the churches, you can have church, but you can't evangelize. And so they told us that all of a sudden, what began to happen is like in Cuba, you can get they ha they have lots of dentists, but they don't have any filling stuff. Like you get your tooth drilled, but they have nothing to put it in. You had to find somebody that you knew from the United States to get you filling. So people are walking around with teeth that were drilled, and they'd walk in front of a church, and God would miraculously fill their teeth. We had more than one told us this. And this is this is real. And they would recognize that it was in front of the church that they got the tooth filled. And a mighty revival took place in Cuba because people would show up to church and I want my teeth filled. <laughs> <laughs> And so they couldn't go outside their door, so God brought them right into the church. Major revival. And there's major things. I'm, I'm, in some ways, when it comes to Cuba, I'm sad and glad that it's still closed. Because there's a, in there, John? Yeah. There's a, I have never seen the church operate in unity like, I, like we saw in Cuba. There is a unity. They have a vision to take their nation. They're working together. One church, if they had one home church of 300 people. Remember this, John? 300 people. Another one was just getting started, and they were willing to send people to that church. Mm -hmm. The competition, now I'm sure there's some bad numbskulls down there like everywhere else, but the spirit of the place is different than any place I've ever been in the world. Mm -hmm. And so even in a closed world like that, God has a way of expanding the kingdom. And we met some great people down there. So be encouraged. It's not up to us. It's not based on us. It's based on Him. Take the pressure off yourself. Folks, when I retire, when I'm 75 or 80 or get near expirement age, whatever God gives me, and I write my memoirs, I won't do it till then because, man, I'm just as human as everybody else. But I watched God do things I don't deserve for Him to do in my life. It's not dependent on me. And now, at this stage, I'm just learning. I say, it ain't really about me. It's never been about me. It's never been about you, but it's all about you. It's not about you when it comes to earning it. It is all about you that He loves you. And if you keep that straight, it gets a lot easier. Man, I screw up. God loves me anyway. Don't I, Patty? I screw up, don't I? Never. Never. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, yep, her mom and her teaming up on me right now. <laughs> Good stuff. All right. What time is it? Time to go? Are they done yet? No. Nobody's coming out yet. They need to get done. We got done before they did. All right. Next week we'll continue in Romans. How far are we going? What's our schedule? Okay. Here's our schedule. Bother the... Next week we have Digging Deeper. Do we have Digging Deeper next week? Yes. 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 The week after Easter? We don't. We don't. So is that two weeks from now? Like Easter yes. is... Yes. So we have it the next two weeks? No. 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 We have it next week and then... No, no this week is Palm after. Sunday. Yes. yes. And we, we have, have it between Palm Sunday and Easter. We're good to go. Okay, that's next week. That's next week. Yeah. And two weeks from now... We do not. The, week at, the we Wednesday after Easter, Easter, we do right. not. We're going to take a break that... Also, so you know, we're not having a Sunday night service the week of Easter. We're having a big, we're having a big Easter service. I mean, if you poked your head in and saw, man, they have they have decorated it. It's really looking good in this in the sanctuary. 
Um, and so we're going to celebrate Easter, but then we want to give people off so they can be with their families on Sunday night. So that's the schedule. So can, you can mention that for the Passover celebration on Friday, we're doing a Seder thing, and if we could, if you could sign up, it would be helpful. So we have an idea of how much. Did everybody going. get that? We're having a Passover celebration, Good Friday at 6:30. But we need you to sign up because we have to know how many, how many yeah, herbs and pieces of lamb and all that to get. Right. It's not eat, a full meal. Eat, eat first. Before yeah, you eat come. before you come eat because we're not feeding you. You'll get a sample. We're gonna, we're gonna, it's going to be a replication we'll of it. Yeah. Yeah. You're going to walk. Yeah. The lamb, the, I'm just going to warn you, the lamb might look a lot like Chick-fil-A nuggets. <laughs> <laughs> okay? Lamb nuggets. <laughs> the lamb nuggets. But don't look for seconds. Should, should yeah. talk to Dan because at the food pantry we could never give away the lamb. <laughs> could never give away yeah. the lamb. Yeah. yeah. But it's, that, that's a great experience because we're going to go to the next level. Last year we went through it, and this year we're going to go to the next level. And we're going to make this so that we can learn experientially what Jesus really did on that Passover. So after three or four years, man, you're going to know this thing pretty well. Um, but it takes that long because it's a cultural shift, man. It's, the cultures are different. Anything just else, have, Patricia? Just have mint jelly with those nuggets and nobody will know. Yeah. That's, there is a chigarash that you have. That's going to be a, like, there has to be a little... What do they call that? A relish type thing. So it is going to be fun. Better herbs. Yeah.